Good morning, guys. Greetings in the name of Jesus Christ. How are you doing? Lord, thank you for the rain. It has been amazing. It has been a long time since we've had weather like this in May in South Texas. It's, a, it's awesome. A lot of people don't like it, but you know what? Rain brings life. Rain waters the earth. Rain is a blessing from God. I give thanks for it. And I give thanks for anybody else who doesn't give thanks for it. Because that's what we're called to do, is to make thanksgivings for other people. So, yeah, that's this is what a blessing it is to have so much rain come down. <clears throat> so this morning I want to ask a question. Because we, we know what the, the common fight is and the common battle is. It's a battle against truth and lies. It's a battle against true believers and people that don't believe. Uh, it's always been the fight, and it always will be the fight until Jesus comes and ends all this stuff. <coughs> so I want to ask, do you know what separates a true born-again believer from everyone else? More specifically, what separates a true born-again believer from a false believer? Someone who looks the part, acts the part, speaks the part, claims the part, but isn't saved. Now, Alan Parr did a video yesterday uh, where Marcus Rogers had called some guy out who was preaching uh, about the gift of tongues and how that, in order for us to communicate with God, we have to have the gift of tongues. And a lot of people believe this, a lot of people. But they've been taught something else. Because that is not what the Bible teaches. They miss the wording. In the specific scripture used, it says, uh, when the Holy Spirit indwells them, uh, these things shall follow those who are saved. And then it gives a list of things, and tongues is one of them. And people think that's their indicator that they should have to have, they, they have to have the thing of tongues. And there are people out there praying for tongues and all that, and it's like, whoa, hold on. Go back and look at the scripture. It says, shall follow. It doesn't say, will follow. It doesn't say, is a requirement. It doesn't say, by the will of the save, of the person who saved. It doesn't say, they will be on demand. And that's what people do. No. It's not true. It's a lie. We've been taught it was true, but it's not true. And there's a lot of people who are nice and polite and kind and loving and caring and believers in Jesus Christ that believe this lie. We have to counter this with the truth. And at that, what that says, shall follow them. That doesn't mean that's what you're going to get, because not everybody gets it. You read the Bible, you see there's plenty of examples where people didn't get it. You see where the apostles had it, and then it disappeared. Anyone ever notice that it talks about them doing that on the day of Pentecost, and then they never did it again after that? It never mentions them doing it again. There's a reason why that is. That gift serves a specific purpose, and it only manifests when that purpose arises. And there are several people who have testimonies where that's happened to them, where other people in the room are like, you just spoke their language perfectly. How did you do that? And the person that did it was unaware that it happened. That was Holy Spirit speaking in tongues. An actual language, not gibberish. Gibberish is not a language. It's not an angel, angel language. It doesn't exist. They've taken half a verse out of context. And I've had people bring that to me, and I tell them, you need to read the rest of the verse. Don't just take half a verse out of context and create a doctrine on that. See, that language is confusion. No one knows what it means. No one in the history of the world has ever been able to interpret it. And when I ask them that, they don't want to talk about that anymore. I'm like, well, hold on a minute now. If there's a language, there has to be an interpreter. And some, in, the, in that particular verse, shall follow. It, there, no, I take that back. It's in 12, 13, or 14 of 1 Corinthians, I think. And he says, some people are given to be interpreters. Why has there never been an interpreter for that, ever, in the history of the world? No recorded, no records exist. No ever, no stories exist of anyone we have plenty of them about people talking in that weird gibberish, but no, nobody ever translated it because it's confusion. And Satan is the author of confusion, like the Bible says. So, so anybody who's doing this stuff needs to step back and take another look. They need to consider that. But the Bible is very clear on this. But that's the indicator I'm showing you. 
for the question that I asked at the beginning. That's one of them. What separates a true born-again believer from everyone else? The true born-again believer doesn't believe the lie. The true born-again believer has something different within their heart than what everyone else has. If you take two people, identical, identical in every way, and you have them both kneel and say the prayer, and then take them both outside and get them baptized, which one is saved? How do you know? A lot of people think that's all it takes. That's it. You do that, you're saved. Well, that's works. You do that, you're saved. You're, that's works. Which one of those guys is saved? The answer to the question is the one that got saved in the heart. The one that changed. The one that was born again inside. Because see, a person, and we have examples in the Bible. Remember Simon the Magician. We have people that go through the whole thing and you can see it. They're like, hey, he believed. And then he didn't. This particular chapter in Galatians we're going to read shows the same thing. Paul planted this church. And then he starts hearing about all these weird things going on. He's like, wait a minute. What happened? You fell off the rails. See, the problem is most of the people that are in the quote-unquote church, as the world defines it, 2.7 billion plus, are not really saved. And the separation is merely one thing. One has a changed heart and one doesn't. Well, how do I know? You say this, but how do I know I have a changed heart? Do the desires that exist within you match what the Bible says should exist within a born-again believer? Or do the desires, and you have to be honest with yourself, or do the desires exist within you that follow the unbeliever? See, the reason why they never said believer and unbeliever on those particular verses was because they had people that claimed to be believers or even thought they were believers that, were, that, that weren't saved, and they were doing these things. So, <coughs> so they shared the fruit. Here's the fruit of the Spirit. This isn't the fruit of the Spirit. They never said believer and unbeliever. Because they were addressing people within the church. They were addressing people within the brotherhood. Because they knew there were people in there who were false converts. So they addressed it by specifics. What's in your heart? Is this or is this? And when a person is honest with themselves and sees this, then they can change. Because they have to see it. They have to see there's a problem. Other people will see those things and go, oh, well, Joe over here, that's how he is. <laughs> Uh-oh, maybe a problem. We need to go see if we can help Joe. Let's pray for him. See, he was sending a message to everybody, to the non-believer. Hey, this is you. You better get right. There's no, no place in the kingdom for you. And for the believer, hey, you need to pray for these people or you need to avoid these people. They were sending messages through their epistles. It's hidden. Because as soon as they started the churches, they, st they started destroying them from the inside out. Satan knew what he was doing. I can't get them on the outside. I'm going to get them on the inside. And he did. And he still is. The greater part of the organization is corrupted, is involved in lies, is misled. In many cases, they have witchcraft involved in it. Some of them don't even realize that's what they're doing. This is why we have to be discerning. This is also why we have to be willing to tell the truth. See, most people aren't. John MacArthur had a video that came out, I think, yesterday, or early this morning, and he was talking about that same thing out of Galatians. In, it was a short, minister, a short uh, excerpt, but even he said the same thing. And most people who are preaching the truth say this. It's, very, it's rarely being talked about. That's one of the problems, because people won't address it. They don't want to offend anybody. I'm here to offend you. I'm here to convict your heart. That's what the Bible does. That's what it was sent for. It's a stumbling stone for those who don't believe. But if we're, if we're never challenged on our faith, if we're never challenged on what we believe in, if we're never reading our word and let, having the Holy Spirit challenges, we believe and get tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. But we don't want that. 
We want to be rock solid in our doctrine. What's the truth? Grace through faith. Simple. Jesus on the cross paying the debt for our sin. Simple. We want to know that we're saved. But there are so many people out there in doubt. And the only thing that causes doubt is lies. The truth doesn't cause doubt. <coughs> the truth causes change. And that change exists within the heart of the person. So the, to answer the an, an original question, a changed heart is what identifies a true born-again believer from a false one. How do we see that? We don't. We have to look at the fruits of the Spirit contained within them because there is a false Holy Spirit. So we look at the fruits being manifested by that Spirit contained within that individual. To the false believer, it'll be the, this list of the wicked things. To the true believer, it'll be this list of the good things. If these exist, that, that person's on the right track. That person's there. If the other things exist, that person's not. And there's no special place that's set aside for those particular people to go anywhere. They don't have a place in the kingdom. They don't. This is a whole, I, how dare you? How dare you tell people that they're unsaved and can't go to the kingdom? Well, I didn't. God did. Do you not know? What does the scripture say? Do you not know? That no drunkard, no reviler, no adulterer, no sexually immoral. None of those people will enter the kingdom of heaven. Now you go be real honest with yourself and see if you fit in that category. See if people you know that you think are Christians fit in that category. Now, what does that mean for us if we if we can if we look and we identify that? Pray for that person. But if you start to see problems, it's better if you don't have anything to do with them. That's what the Bible says. Not that because you hate them, it's just because that you can get pulled into their lives. It's very easy to do. And you don't want that. You don't want to be pulled into that stuff. You can't trust everybody as much as we'd like to. As much as we want to say, oh, well, you know what? The Lord's going to lead me into all the good things. I don't have to worry about it. The Lord will lead me where he wants me. A lot of people use that as a, that particular statement as an excuse for sin. Talked to a guy in 2019 about that. No, 2020 about that. And he was very descriptive on what he was involved in. And he said, the Lord led me there, so I'm doing it. Uh, no, that's wrong. So, you that you led you there. So, the changed heart is the indicator. Now, this isn't just an instantaneous change like a lot of people think. This is a lifetime of change. This is a growth process. And anybody who's still alive today, who, who's been a Christian for 40, 50, 60 years, they'll tell you it's a process of growth. And it solidifies within you. And if you can make it into your 50s, 60s, and 70s and still be a Christian... It's locked in. I'm not talking about a Christian in the general sense, a true born-again believer. Because it becomes a part of your life. It becomes aspect of your life. You will change according to these things. It's a natural progression of having a new heart and being born again in the Spirit. Everything about you will change. Everything within your life will change. It, it takes time, but it will. <coughs> I've talked to people who have moved to whole, completely different states after being saved. They said, I can't be a Christian here. The Bible supports that. A prophet is not without honor, save in his own country. Jesus couldn't talk to anybody and where he was from. He had to go away from there to talk to people. Because nobody would listen where he was from. They all knew him. Same thing happens here. I can't hardly talk to anybody. Everybody knows me. Now, I'm not saying I'm a prophet. Don't, don't read more into what I'm saying. Everybody knows me. But if I go somewhere else... I can captivate an audience. Part of the reason why I do this here online, because I can't travel that much. This is easier. I can reach the maximum amount of people. Got people on here from the UK, from China, Africa. The problem that we have today is that there are people who look the part. I just had a channel recently. Somebody was suggesting a channel to me. And I looked, looked at one of their prayer live streams and the young man seemed like he was pretty on point. And then there's a video of him mocking the rapture.
if you speak the truth, if you speak the truth from the scripture, if you read the scripture, you will be attacked by almost everyone that hears you. You will offend almost everyone that hears you. You will hurt the feelings of almost everyone that hears you because every one of us has to have conviction. But less than 1% of us know what to do with it or even how to identify it. We think it's, oh, I can't believe he said that. That's why I had so many people come to me, especially in 2020. I can't believe you said that. I said what? That part in the video. Okay, give me a timestamp so I can go hear it. Because I have no idea what you're talking about. Oh, okay. That's, I was reading from the Bible. I can't believe you said that. Well, I was reading the Bible. And I had to tell one lady, you need to stop and think about what you just said. You can't believe I said that. I was reading the Bible. So you're mad at the Bible? No, that's not what I'm saying. Well, that's exactly what you're saying because that's what I was reading. It was the scripture. You're not mad at me. You're mad at God. But see, people don't know how to identify it because they're blind. They don't know how to, how to engage it or deal with it because they've never been challenged before. Now, true born-again believers, they're going to swing into the Lord. Lord, show me the truth on this. Those who aren't are going to go the other direction. And they're going to go latch onto and stick with people who give them what they want, not what they need. Because sometimes what we need is a bitter meal, of stale bread, and old water. Sometimes we need to be fed with the sharper blades of grass instead of the soft, chewy, the softer, tender ones. Because that reminds us to stay in the faith. It reminds us to stay with the Lord. It reminds us not to wander into other myths. And guys, some of the stuff, if you go back and look at my videos from mid to late 2019 through the beginning of 2020, some of the stuff I found, it would just sicken you. Some of the things. That one channel that I found, I even told my wife about it and she's like, what? Are you serious? Yes, I'm serious. I could not believe it. It was just one night late, I was up, and uh, I can't even repeat what was going on. I can't even repeat. It, it was that disgusting, and they were attaching Jesus' name to it. And it was a group of people who thought they were saved. I told them in his comment section, actually I sent him a message on his community tab, or discussion tab. I, like, I can't believe that this is what you're propagating here, this is what you're telling people and teaching them. This is wrong. Well, you just don't understand because you're not one of us. No, you're not one of anyone. <laughs> you guys are by yourselves. And what you're doing is disgusting. And it shames, brings shame upon the Lord, not glory. Right into another guy that said Jesus and the Holy Spirit were women. Because of one word in the Bible. One single word. So I promptly commented to him and I put in his video. If somebody sent it to me. I put in his video. Here's the scriptures and here's the Greek and the Hebrew and what it really means. You're misrepresenting this. I'm a scholar of languages. I don't care who you are. You still got it wrong. You're trying to make money. And, and that's, a, that's another thing. If you're looking at channels, if you find a channel that's got a ton of people on it, be careful. Now, there's good channels out there with lots of subscribers. But if you run across a channel that's got a lot of subscribers, I'm talking about, you know, 90, 100,000, 60,000 to 100,000, way up there. Uh, again, there's a lot of good channels that have a lot of subscribers that are okay, but if you see one that has a lot of subscribers, be wary, because the only way they have a ton of subscribers is if they're telling people not so much the truth, but the good things to, to, to make them feel good about themselves. So you have to be careful. That's part of the reason why I alienated myself away from so much of that stuff because so many people were doing ear service and lip service and they weren't telling people the truth of the matter. They weren't digging into the harder, bitter scriptures. I'm one of the few channels that does this. There are very few that do this and all of us, so far the ones that I've seen, all of us have very few subscribers. Several channels who were really, really high up their channels their messages have changed to start telling these truths. And the deeper they go into them, the, blood, the more subscribers they lose. People don't want to hear that. I've already lost people in this morning prayer. They don't want to hear this. 
The problem is, God is trying to get this message out there through his people who will preach it. And nobody wants to hear it. God is calling to us. Hey, people, listen. Those things you think that I'm, I approve of, get away from those things. They're not helping you. They're not glorifying me. I, don't, I want you to be separate from those things. I want you to be a people set apart. I want you to be unique. The world isn't supposed to like you, yet we desperately try to get the world to like us. It's ridiculous. But this is the state that we're in as a church. People are either afraid to preach the truth or they just don't know it, but they want to be a preacher. You need to get on right the right track first. If you can't identify a believer from a false believer, you cannot be a teacher. You have to know who you're dealing with. You have to know, because there's people out there, they, they just want to stand in the baptism all day and just dunk people underwater. You can't baptize everybody. That is a, a, an act reserved for the converted. And how many people, how many people pollute the baptism of Christ by getting baptized and not being converted? Now, it's not that baptism is a, is a focus, but that's a sacred act between the believer and God, between the believer and Jesus Christ. That's the first act of obedience. Christ said, get baptized, we get baptized. Not for salvation, but because of salvation. And how many people have polluted those waters not being converted? Yet they were happy to walk through there and take something that isn't theirs. I guarantee you it had no, no effect on their salvation. So Galatians 5, Paul gets into this. Very specifically. It's titled Christian Liberty. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. And do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. If Christ freed you, be free. Tend towards that freedom. Don't go back into the bondage of sin. Don't go back into the bondage of the law. We just talked about this yesterday. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. If you will live according to works, Christ will profit you nothing. And I testify again to every man who, became, who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. Now back then, that was the act of converting, was circumcision. They were trying to counter that. And today, it's, circumcision is, is a health practice. Uh, I'm circumcised. Most, people, most men are circumcised. That's something that is just done. And nothing, nothing to do with living under the law. But back then, that's what the problem was. That was the indicator. That was the identifier that you were uh, part of the law. You have become estranged from Christ. You who attempt to be justified by the law, you have fallen from grace. Now, that's for us. You have become estranged from Christ. You who attempt to be justified by the law, you have fallen from grace. Why do we honor God's law? Because we love God. Now, we don't we don't fulfill the law because the law is, is of no effect for us. Why do we look at the Ten Commandments and consider what they say? Why do we compare them to what John said and what Jesus said? Why do we look at them and learn what they actually mean and what they're telling us to do as Christians? Because we love God. We love Jesus Christ. We want to obey. Our desire being born again is to obey our Lord and Savior, not become justified by those things. See, it's about what's in your heart. Some people will say, oh, I do the same thing, but what's in their heart? And we can't see exactly what's in their heart, but the fruit of that will manifest on the outside of them. So these people who try to justify themselves by living sinless, by living according to the Ten Commandments, by living according to the law, by doing all these things they think is doing something for them, it's putting them in a better place with the Lord. That's justification. They're self-justifying. They have been estranged from Christ. They can't. They can't be saved yet. They have to change. They have to repent. They have fallen from grace, like verse 4 says. For we through the Spirit eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. I know the Lord is bringing righteousness with him. I can't be righteous. I'm not righteous. He's bringing it with him. I get those things through him, not through me, not through what I do. That's why... I don't get to do the things I want to do. I don't get to donate like I want to donate. I don't get to do the acts like I want to do them. But I'm not worried because I know that I'm not going outside of his will. 
those acts don't help me. The true works that make the difference, the true works that matter, are the spiritual works. For we through the Spirit eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith working through love. Look, look at verse 6 again. Let me highlight this. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision, law, nor uncircumcision, no law, avails anything but faith working through love. Ironically, faith through love is the two commandments John gives when he repeats the same statement Jesus said in uh, John 5 or 6, I think, or 4. He repeats the same statement and then says, and here are these commandments. He says it quite clearly in 1 John. Here are these commandments. Believe, love. That's the law we fulfill. And you go into the Ten Commandments, exclude the rest of that stuff. You don't need the rest of that stuff. You go into the Ten Commandments and you see which ones are faith and which ones are love and which ones are both. By faith and love, you fulfill the law. I believe Jesus is coming. I believe and know that I cannot be perfect. I need him to make me perfect. I believe and know that there's a day coming when he will make me perfect. I know I can't do enough good stuff to counter anything that I've done that's bad. I know that I can't do enough good stuff to make him love me more. He already loves me as much as he's going to love me. The things that I do, I do because I love my brothers and sisters. I love my fellow man and I love my God. And that's my driving force behind those things. If my driving force was anything other than that, they would be sticks and hay and worthless. The prayers that I pray are because I love my brethren and my God. Those things that I do to glorify God, those are the things that matter. Those are the things that will stand in the beam of seed. Everything else is worthless. So I wait for my Lord and Savior. I live in faith. I walk in faith. I wait in faith for those things. We have all these other people out there that are trying to bring heaven down here so they can have you can have your best life now here on earth. No. I don't want it here. I want to be in heaven with the Lord. That's, that's another indicator of who's saved and who isn't. Because somebody who's trying to bring heaven here and have heaven here, they don't understand. It's not for here. It's for up there. And if you get your best life here, Jesus said the parable. What did Abraham tell the rich man? You had your good life. You had your best life now. And now you're tormented. Whereas Lazarus didn't. He suffered his whole life, and now he's comforted. Jesus put that parable in there and worded it that way for a reason. So we have to pay attention to those things. You ran well, verse 7. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? Everything was going great. You, I planted you guys. You guys were saved. You guys were good to go. What happened to you? Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion does not come from him who calls you, Jesus Christ. It doesn't come from him. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. A little law. A little law. Ruins the whole thing. So you can't be a Christian and follow the Jewish law. You can't be a Christian and try to cultivate your life around those Ten Commandments. And we look at the Ten Commandments and I look at my life and go, okay, where's, where's the problems here? Is anything outside of the guidelines God has made? But I don't live my life according to those. Because if I did, I wouldn't do anything for anybody. I wouldn't talk to anybody. I wouldn't do nothing for anybody unless they did the same thing. And that's the problem we see with people today trying to do this. They, be, they put themselves in a, an exclusive group. Now it's legalism. You can't do that. Because I can't take what I'm doing and what God is leading me to do and lay that on someone else and say, you need to be doing this too. What do I tell you guys when you communicate with me privately? Go to the Lord. Find out what his will is in this situation for you to do. I can only give you advice and share you scripture. I can't tell you what to do. You have to go to the Lord and find out what he wants you to do because your life is different than mine. Where he's leading you and where he has saved you and what he's doing with you is different than what he's doing with me. So one person who leads a very righteous life is the exact same Christian as the person who can't get out of their 
sins. They struggle. They hate their sin. They, they want to be out of their sin, but they struggle all the time. God loves both of them the same. He saved both of them if they're born again. Now, the person who makes excuses, that's different. Again, it's what's in the heart. A true born-again believer has that born-again heart, that changed heart. So that regardless of the life they live, thief on the cross, regardless of the life they live, if they're saved, they're saved. Because it's the heart that changes, not everything on the outside. Some of the best-looking Christians are some of, some of the worst offenders of the gospel. I dare say most of the best-looking Christians are offenders of the gospel. If you lead a, a thousand people to Christ and you pray for them, and they, they say they believe, I promise you only 10% are only going, only 10 are going to believe. 100 out of that thousand may convert. And after five years, that may change. It may go down. It probably will go down. That's the process. That's how it works. So what do we do? We look inward. We identify within ourselves what the problem is within us. <clears throat> but the problem that Paul was dealing with here in Galatians is that he was, they were getting into their little cliques and their little groups. People who are charismatic were coming in there. And they were like, hey guys, check this out. And they were getting sucked into those little groups and little cliques. And then there was contention in the church. We're not supposed to be contention in the church. We're all supposed to be of one group. Regardless of the life we live. Regardless of where we come from. Regardless of who we are. We're all supposed to be of the same group. A little leave and leave us the whole lot. Let me finish with these scriptures so we can pray. Verse 10. I have confidence in you. In the Lord. That you will have no other mind. But he who troubles you shall bear his judgment. Whoever he is. So the people that are doing these things have a judgment before them. They know this. They won't admit it, but they know it. Because when you bring it up to them, they don't want to talk anymore. <laughs> because they know the truth. And I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why do I still suffer persecution? Then the offense of the cross has ceased. If a person is telling the truth, they should be under severe persecution. People should be avoiding them. There should be hatred of that person. But if a person, the Bible says, beware... When men speak good of you, if that person is pretty popular, I'm not saying there is a problem, but there sure could be, because we're not supposed to be that way. If you're telling the truth from the scriptures, if you're bearing the wire and saying, look, here's what, it's, what it is, people are going to hate you for it. That's what the Bible says very specifically. They will hate you for doing that. Every person in the Bible, everyone that was ever identified by God, all the prophets, everybody, including Jesus Christ, were hated for preaching the true message of the gospel. Is it no wonder that the people of the earth, those of us now that are telling people the truth about what's going on, are, con are treated the same way? When Jesus was alive, how many thousands of people does the Bible say were added to their group? When Jesus resurrected and came and visited everybody, how many people did he visit? 10%. Only 10%. Maybe even a little less. That's how it's supposed to be. That's how it's going to go. God's prophecies are going to be fulfilled. He's got a plan. So we don't fear those things. We look at that and how does that affect me? That's what you have to ask. You don't look at it and go, well, how does that affect Janet and Frank? How does that affect me? What is that t saying to me? Because if I'm not in the right place, I need to do something. I need to fix this. I need to change direction and change my mind. I need to repent. And I'm going to look at what the Bible says are the fruits of that false spirit. And then I know who to stay away from. So that I don't get influenced. So that I don't get taken in. So that I don't get drawn into their stuff. You have to draw a hard line. You have to put your foot down and say, no, I'm not going to do that. That's not what the scriptures say. You're misunderstanding the scriptures. You're mispreaching the scriptures. I think every pastor, every pastor, 
It should be a requirement. They, they go get a rock out of the driveway, a smooth, or out of the river, a smooth rock. And they carry that rock with them and they set it on the podium with them when they're preaching. So they will be reminded that God can replace them as preacher of that church with that rock. And they better do it right. But the problem is we don't hold people accountable anymore. There's no accountability for your actions anymore. Well, God has a day for that. It's not going to be a good day. And those who won't hold themselves accountable, those who won't preach the truth from the scriptures, those who are doing everything they can to try not to offend people and to counter anybody who does preach the truth. See, some people just don't say it. Some people don't say it, but they try to make other people, shut other people down that do say the truth. Have a judgment coming. Again, verse 11, And I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why do I suffer persecution? Then the offense of the cross has ceased. If I was siding with everyone else, I would have three, 4,000 subscribers. If I was doing what they were doing, if I continued with them and just kept my mouth shut and custom tailored my message to the way they wanted it, I would have thousands of subscribers. But I would also be sucked into that deception. I would also be pulled into the money game they got going on. I don't want that. That's not my interest. I want God. So the consequences are only about 30 or 40 people watch my videos. It's supposed to be that way. Because very few people really want the truth. And of those 30 and 40 people, some of them are looking for something they can use to make a video about me trying to make me look bad. Not everybody's going to be saved. This is the harsh reality of this. Not everybody will be saved. That's why he's given 2,000 years for the church to be collected. Because not everybody will be saved. <clears throat> Verse 12. I could wish that those who trouble you would even cut themselves off. I think the actual word used there for cut themselves off is mutilate. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh. But through love serve one another. Don't take advantage of God's grace. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, you shall love your neighbor <coughs> as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, beware, lest you be consumed by one another. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The way to get out of sin, if you have a sin you want to get rid of, the way to get out of it is by being led by the Spirit. Let the Spirit talk to you. The Holy Spirit talks through this channel a lot, to a lot of people, because a lot of people confess, that's the message I was looking for. I prayed that last night, and then you answered it today. That's good. Don't thank me, thank God, because He is the one that's speaking. There's a reason why. My channel goes the way it goes. There's a reason why it's run the way it's run. There's a reason why I get attacked so much. And it's not because of me. It's because of God. It's because of the truth. It's because of the scripture. Of all the channels I've seen out there, there's maybe a small handful of us that share the high level of scripture that we share. In any one video on any channel, you might get five scriptures. But there's a tiny handful of us out here on YouTube and a few other things that will share you 20, 30, 40, 50 scriptures to prove the point clearly, to show exactly what the Bible says. You can't prove a point otherwise. A single verse does not make a doctrine. So, again, let me ask this question. Do you know the difference between a true born-again believer and someone who isn't truly born again? Because they can look like the neighbor down the street who's, the na who's an atheist, or the Baptist across the street, or the evangelical next door. They can all look identical. The Satanist. You know how many people are Satanists and you don't even know it? And you live next door to them? 
You don't even know they're saying this. So over the years, I've learned what to look for. And if I get invited in their house, I'll, I'll see it. I'll see those indicators. Oh, y'all are into some dark stuff. I, I, I asked a person one time, because they had a picture on their wall. I said, oh, Satanist, huh? Satanist. Like, yeah, you worship Satan, right? What would make you say that? Well, this picture on the wall, first of all, you don't see the pentagram right there in the center? Well, that's just a picture I picked up. Is it? I said, well, there's a few other things around here. You smudge your house often? They got that little bundle of sage and burn it to the house. I, said, I, I, I told him, I said, I'll be honest with you, I see a lot of witchcraft stuff going on here. There's some issues. Have you buried any potatoes in the yard under the full moon, which is an act in Wiccan, which is witchcraft? That person didn't want me in their house anymore. It wasn't because I accused him of something. It was because I saw it. I saw the indicators. They realized that somebody was in the house that they didn't want to fellowship with. These people went to church. And they were doing witchcraft in their home. How do you call yourself a Christian and do those things? Do those things that are directly contrary to God and His will and His Word. See, that's another indicator of what's in a person's heart. Do they do what God says or do they do the opposite of what God says? If you can't back up what you're doing and what you're saying with the maximum amount of Scripture possible, the bulk of Scripture should support it, you're doing something wrong. Now, I'm not saying this, and I didn't put this commentary out there to make people mad, but it's going to do that. I didn't put it out there to offend anybody, but it's going to do that. I didn't put, I didn't say all these things and put them out there because I'm trying to make enemies, but it's going to do that. I know that because when the savior of the entire world, of all of mankind, arrived on this earth, instantly he was persecuted. Instantly, people sought to kill him from the time he was born until the time they did finally get to do what they wanted to do. That when truth comes, mankind attacks it. Very few people believe it. Very few people pay attention to it. So anytime you're going to give truth, anytime you're going to be honest with someone, you are going to be vehemently attacked for it. That's why so many channels started in 2019 and ended in 2020. That's when so many channels started in 2020 and ended by the end of 2020. 2020 destroyed a lot of YouTube channels and other channels of people who weren't ready, of people who weren't prepared, who thought it was going to bring them glory, and it didn't. It brought them attacks and hatred. And so they shut their channels down. They deleted their content. Not realizing is that if they were called, they did not answer their call. We're not called to do this for a time. We're called to do this until the Lord returns. Until the Lord takes us. Be it rapture or death. I can no, long, I can no more turn back from this than anything else that I do. But the difference is, I love the truth. I always have. Because the truth has never turned me away. All the people that I've ever known in my life, the thousands upon thousands of people that I've known, the liars turned me away. But the one who, ones who believed in the truth always stuck with me. The ones who believed in the truth always accepted me. And I regret that I got separated from every one of them. And, and it kills me, but it is what it is. That's what Satan likes to do, separate people. I love the truth. I love integrity. Those things dwell within my heart. And anyone who really wants God is exactly the same. Not because I'm that way, but because that's how he makes us. That we would love the truth. Love peace. Love everyone as much as we possibly can. It's just unfortunate that we see things going the way they are. But then again, Second Thessalonians tells us this is going to happen. The great apostasy. We're witnessing it. 
people that I talked to last year, 2019, they've gone on and, and gotten attached to weird stuff. Many of them, not all, but many of them. They didn't endure. So we pray for them. We ask God to have mercy on them and to show them the light and bring them back home. And we give thanks that we have what we have. We give thanks that we are where we are and that we can see what we can see. Because I'll tell you what, it, this is from my personal viewpoint, it is better to be on this side of the hatred than on the other side of the hatred. I would rather be on this receiving end than be on the giving end because the giving end brings judgment, serious judgment. Being on the receiving end brings glory, brings reward, brings peace. And when that day is realized, everyone will realize it. And that's only because I read the word and I see what it says. That's why I believe it. God is truth. So if you hate truth, then you must hate God. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning in the name of Jesus Christ to give you praise, to give you honor, and to give you glory, and to sing praises unto your holy name. Father, we give thanks. First of all, let us give thanks for the rain and this wonderful weather you have brought in this time of year when we usually don't have this weather. And I make intercessory prayer for those who have not given thanks for this. I give thanks for them too. As you tell us, that's what you want us to do. This is a good thing. I give thanks for them too because we all needed this rain. South Texas has had a lot of drought. Thank you again, Father, for this. It's a wonderful blessing. We have a problem in the church. And it's not even just the church. This has been something that's been ongoing throughout human history. People don't love the truth. They say they do, they think they do, but in reality, they don't. And that is evidenced by their actions. It's evidenced by their desires, by what they decide is true or not, or what they decide is good for them or not. And the horrible part of it is, we show them your word, and we can't get them to see the light. Well, I wasn't sent to, to save people. I wasn't sent to change people. You didn't send me to do this, to do that. You change people. You change their hearts. You open their eyes. You grant them repentance, like your word says. What do I do? What do people who answer the call for the ministry, what do they do? Share the truth. And Lord, you know I don't want to fail in my ministry. So whenever you show me something, I don't have any fear sharing it. Because I want to make sure that I'm preaching the truth from your word. The consequences of that have brought on hordes of attacks. It's shocking. How violent Christians, quote unquote Christians, react to the truth when they don't like the truth. And it shows who people really are. You've done a wonderful thing in that you have exposed people for who they are. You've brought all the secrets up to the surface. That those that you called to preach the truth, those that you called to, to give people what your word really says, are standing strong and pushing forward. But we're a finite group. And actually, surprisingly small group. But nevertheless, it all works to your will. So, Father, I thank you for these attacks. I thank you for this hatred. I thank you for this ministry that stirs people up, that causes people to be convicted. Because I know conviction helped me, and I know it helps others. I thank you for leading all of us into this, and really it's a tiny group that we all, that we are all a part of here, leading us together to share in these truths to discover things about ourselves we didn't know, but that are brought to light by your word. To learn more about you and what your will is for us. Your word shows us that. It shows us our deepest, darkest secrets. It exposes what's in our hearts so that we may purge it and take in truth and light and peace and understanding. And you make it so easy. But the hardest part is taking that first step. Well, to everyone listening to this prayer right now, it's only the first step that's scary. 
The rest after that are very easy. And God makes it easy on purpose, but he wants to see you move that foot. Father, I pray for all who are listening, that if there are some things they are denying, that you open their eyes to the truth and open their hearts to receive conviction and receive truth and so that they would desire to be changed. So they would come to you in prayer and ask you to change the things that need to be changed within them. I've prayed this prayer multiple times, many times. Lord, find what's in me. Search me out. Find what's in me. Find what's in my heart. And remove it. Remove it and replace with it with what you want there so that I serve you diligently, so that I serve you in truth. I pray that my brothers and sisters, I pray that everyone's listening, those who are on the other side, those who are doing those things, I pray that they hear these words and it clicks in their heart and that they will turn to you so that you can show them the truth. And I pray that you have mercy on them and grant them repentance. But I can't really ask that for them. That's what you have. They have to ask you for that. So I pray that they do that. I pray that they go to you. Confide in you. Go to your word, which we give thanks for. Profuse thanks for this word that shows us the truth. The, the wonderful work that I'm witnessing happening, even in the midst of everything that's going on, even in the midst of the fighting and the wars and the riots, there's riots happening in other countries that have nothing to do with anything in that country. They're rioting because of Israel. They're rioting because of us. It's It's nonsense. But you have awakened the truth in a few people. And they are standing up. But most people aren't listening. And that's unfortunate and I regret that. But I know that that's the way it is. Because your words gives multiple examples of this. That's the way it is. People won't listen. They won't hear you. And it's been going on for thousands of years. And you are no stranger to it, certainly. You were there at the beginning and saw it happen. Father, I pray you grant us grace and mercy. I pray you grant us repentance. I pray you grant us time to see the light. I know we don't have much time, but time to see the light and to wake up. To wake up. To wake up to your truth. Yes, I did borrow that from Chad. Watch him on the wall, 88. We need to be awake. We need to be visually aware. We need to be spiritually aware of what's happening around us and within us. Father, I pray you make that happen within, within us, that we are visually and spiritually aware of what's happening. A lot of people aren't even aware the world is coming apart. Please help us to honor you and to glorify you in all that we do. In these prayers, in our daily lives, in our personal prayers, in our scripture reading, please help us dedicate more time to you and to your word. That is where truth comes from. You are truth, the God of truth. The only way we get truth is from you. The only thing we have from you now, aside from our prayer life, is this word. Father, I pray we come to the knowledge of the truth. Not just people that are always learning. That we come to a knowledge of the truth, a saving knowledge of the truth. So that lives are changed. And so that we have and we speak with authority when we talk about that, your word, and what it really says. I pray the Holy Spirit will call up those scriptures when the time is right. Help us make the right decisions. Help us get out of situations that we should not be in and help us endure to the end. Because you've got a plan. You're going to save those that are yours. We know this, we believe this, and we trust this. And we thank you, Father, for that day. We bless you, we praise you, we honor you and glorify you. In Jesus' name, we sing praises to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you guys for joining me for morning prayer.
it doesn't seem like it's that big of an issue, but it really is important for us to look inward, to self-examine and see where we are in our faith. And then to go to the Word and find it. It's a simple Google search, eSword search, openbible.info. It's simple and easy to find these things. Technology today has made it super easy to go through the Bible. People had to memorize the Bible before, and they would only have one book or even part of a book. We have the ability to search the entire Bible in five seconds. God made those tools available to us. Why aren't we using them? Let us first prove who we are and where we stand and then prove someone else. Jesus made an interesting analogy. Remove the plank from your eye before you remove the speck from your brother's eye. I can't remove any specks. I still have a plank in my eye because I still need him to save me. And that day is coming when he, when he will. While I'm here, I can certainly share the truth. I can sure, certainly share my personal experiences and what's worked for me. And it may work for someone else or it may help someone else come to their own place and their own connection. It could open eyes. But all those things don't happen through me or anyone else. It happens through God. You must go to Him. That starts with examining yourself. Where am I at? I need to go to the Lord with this. And you lay it before His feet and He will deal with it. He will change you. He will help you. I know. It happened to me. It happens to all of us. If you're a child of God, there is a day of redemption coming. There is a day when all of this will end. You must endure to the end. Wait on the Lord. Have patience. Have peace. One of the key virtues of a Christian is patience. Have patience. You may feel like you're in a rut. Don't go, don't look. If you're in a rut, if you feel like you're in a rut, don't look elsewhere for truth. Go to God and wait on Him. It may be quiet for a while. There are several times in the Bible where God was quiet for 400 years. You may have to wait. Do what you were called to do and stay with that. Walk in the way you were called and stay with that. Hold on to what you have and stay with that until the Lord comes to you and does something. That's what I'm doing. I'm waiting until the Lord comes and brings me something else. Until then, I'm going to do what I was called to do. He got me solid in this. He got me locked in. Now we're moving forward. And I have dry spells where I feel like things are quiet, where I struggle to get the morning prayers out. But you know what? I'm not going to stop because I know I'm going to have those tip spells. That's how he does things. Test your faith. Will you keep going if I step away for a minute? We're being prepared for heaven. Remember that. We're being prepared for heaven. So if you hit a dry spell, that's okay. It's a, he's testing your faith. Stand in what you know. Walk in what you believe in. Focus on what you are called to do. And just do that until the Lord returns. Until he comes and says, hey, here's something else. You guys have been with me and heard me struggle through videos. And then two to three days later, Spirit comes back and it's just a flow. A beautiful flow. There are some times where I end these videos and I look up and say, wow, that was awesome. Let the Lord lead. Let him show you the truth. Let him teach you. Because the light that turns on is so bright and it exposes everything. Every corner is illuminated. And if you find those things within you that you know don't align with God's will, change it. But make sure that what's in your heart is right. Are you changing it so you can look good or are you changing it so you can glorify God? That's the difference between a born-again believer and a false convert. That's the difference between Christians and the rest of the world. What's it in our heart? Romans 8. I love you guys. I bless you all in Jesus' name, and I will see you in the next video.